And as people, as people enter the room, I just want to confirm that you are entering the mob programming panel. Welcome. We'll get started right, right a, as soon as everyone completes entering. So I am going to give it about 30 seconds more, and then we're going to kick things off. My name's Carolyn, and I am moderating this panel today together with Cindy. And our speakers for this panel today are Nancy and Caitlin. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. So we are arriving at this panel because my passion for mob programming began. I'm in startup sales and I'm moderating this panel on mob programming specifically because I'm so passionate about how it pairs quality with empowerment and innovation, which is what Witty is all about, right? So mob programming, we understand, is a term that some of you probably have never heard or some of you have. This panel was designed to answer a few basic questions, and I'm just going to state them out loud now as people continue to enter the room. We're going to help you answer the following. What does mob programming mean for the business person? How can knowledge of this way of working help you with your growth? How can it empower you and your team? And how can you get started? We have left time for some questions. I should be monitoring the chat, but if you have a chat question, Cindy's my backup. Cindy G is my backup for this session. Nancy and Caitlin, as I stated earlier, are gonna give their own introductions. This way of work does translate beyond the technical. So. The reason that Nancy and Caitlin are speaking together is to speak to that. Nancy's background's more technical, Caitlin's also technical, and a bunch of her experience is on the business side. So let's just do a quick poll before we begin. And I just need to check my options. I don't think that I can, for some reason I'm having difficulty seeing people. Let me just ask the question. And Cindy, we may need to have you help with the answers. The question is, could everyone in this session right now identify as either a technical or non-technical person? Are you a technical or non-technical person? That would help our speakers. And I see some of you are here and we don't have any answers yet. Would you identify as technical or non-technical? Otherwise, you want to just put it in the chat. <laughs> so we have someone who is non-technical with a technical background. So a non-technical manager with a technical background. Yeah, I, that's funny, Sophia, that's funny. And Julie, Julie's non-technical. So she's saying she's non-technical. So as the answers continue to come in, if they're heavily weighted in one way or another, we can certainly adjust or modify, but I'm gonna turn the microphone over to you, Nancy. Why don't we kick things off? I will be at the 15 minute mark, I will gently remind you out loud that we're at 15 minutes so we can continue on. Thank you, Carolyn. That'll help us stay on track. Um, everybody, I, I'm very thrilled to be part of this, uh, this uh, session today. I'm very impressed with the quality of the panels so far in this conference. And well, we'll see, we'll see how this one goes. I'm also really pleased to be co-presenting with Caitlin Gould. Here's a little bit about my background. Um, uh, my educational background is started in electrical engineering and, and then I got interested in software uh, partway through, ended up with what it amounts to a double major. I've had um, 15, 20 years uh, field experience, uh, at least 15 of that's been in safety critical applications in various uh, industry sectors mainly uh, aerospace, a uh, fair amount of medical device experience, industrial controls, instrumentation, and so forth. Um, financial services is there because later uh, I moved to just coaching agile teams. I shouldn't say just, because <laughs> it's a lot. But um, 
I, I shifted to that because it really is uh, the way of the future. And uh, so I've coached in that industry as well. I've authored several papers and articles on lean and agile methods applied to hardware, software, and embedded systems, especially. And I'm co-author of the book, Agile Methods for Safety Critical Systems. And uh, Brian and I are working on our second book uh, now. I'm also president of Agile New England in Boston area. And I consult and coach for companies interested in high quality. Uh, it tends to be in the medical space these days quite a bit. Um, although I'm not you know, limited to one industry. Caitlin, how about if you introduce yourself? Great, so my name is Caitlin Gould. I'm one of the directors at Blue Fruit Software. Um, Blue Fruit's based in the UK, but you can probably tell from my accent. I'm originally from California, and I graduated with a degree in graphic design from UC Davis, which uh, led to some experience in website design and development. I also did a stint in publishing, focusing on digital publishing and worked in digital marketing before starting at Blue Fruit, which is an embedded software company. More on that later. Um, interesting fact, I'm the only non-engineer on the exec team. Um, so that always creates some interesting communication opportunities. Um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're based in England. So Blue Fruit Software, it's important to state we're focused on uh, quality software development for a number of different products and sectors. So um, also important for the topic today and something that else that Nancy and I have in common, in addition to mob programming, we're also lean agile practitioners. And it's something that we use um, our lean agile processes to be constantly thinking about how we can improve ways that we deliver for our clients um, and how to help them see better results. Thank you. Um, we're gonna cover uh, basically three topics. First, what is mob programming? I realize it's a new idea to most of our audience. Uh, I'll talk about why it's better and safer. Um, and we'll talk about who's using it and how they're taking it beyond software. Caitlin has some great uh, case studies to share with us. Well, first of all, what is it? Um, you may have heard of agile software um, methodologies or practices. Uh, that's really become the mainstream now over the last uh, 10 or so years in software development. Uh, you may have heard terms like Scrum or Safe or Extreme Programming or some of these kinds of terms. And if you haven't, don't worry about it. You're, you're still okay for this session. But the point is they all have practices. And there's a number of different practices people may use like stand up meetings daily, uh, short cycles where they deliver something, things like that. My programming is a practice. Every team doesn't have to do it. They can still be agile, even if they don't do it. If they do it, I think most will be pleased, but it's not necessarily for everybody. So. Let me just say that at the start here, I'm not one of these people that, um, you know, one thing solves everything. So what is it? It's a software development approach. Basically, the whole team, and we're talking about small teams, five, six people max, the whole team works on the same thing at the same time, in the same space, and at the same computer. And it's okay if you do this remotely because uh, teams have been using it remotely for years and years now, not just because of the COVID restrictions. So let's, uh, let's have a look at what it looks like. It started in 2011 in San Diego. And I wanna tell you a little bit about how it got started because that will help you understand some important things about it. Um, at, a, at a company called Hunter, Hunter Industries in San Diego, um, they, you know, like many companies, they, they felt a need to turn things around and how software development was happening. Um, Woody Zool is a person who had some experience as an agile coach, and he, he was brought in to be manager for a software team there. Uh, the company makes um, sprinkler systems and irrigation systems for landscape uh, purposes. So it's not in safety critical, but it is uh, embedded systems work. Um, so anyway, Woody Zool is most well known in the world in connection with mob programming because more recently he's become independent and he's been teaching and speaking about it uh, in many places. I also want to mention Llewellyn Falco in connection with this because he's a coach I know and that's how come I became aware of what this team was doing, I don't know, within a year or so of them starting to, to use these practices. 
And it got started because, so here they are sitting, they're all looking at a screen. They're all around their table. There's Woody over at the right. <clears throat> and uh, they're conversing and working together on their software. You may see a, more than five people there. One of them is their product owner who's working with them. Here's what it looks like from the other side, okay? So how did they get going on working this way? Well, um, Woody understood the importance of having the team be in control of their process. And he, got, he the company agreed with him as you know part of how he'd work when he came there. So he wanted to give the team some latitude over how they worked. And he started off by inviting them to create learning sessions every day. They were curious to learn some of the agile techniques like test-driven development and continuous integration. These are methods that help you test as you go. And um, they were curious to just learn some of that. So he gave them time each day to have a learning session. And Llewellyn came into the picture because um, he came in to, um, to teach some of these, uh, these techniques. Well, what they did was they used a learning style where people take turns at the computer and they're all thinking together as they work through problems. All right, so it was natural for them um, a couple months later or so when it was time to get one of the tough projects and start working on it, it was natural for them to say, hey, first let's learn where that project is at. Let's learn what the situation is. So let's get together in this you know, round robin fashion and start studying it and understanding it. Well, pretty soon they were saying to uh, Woody, hey, you know, um, we want to just keep working this way as we <laughs> this project, can we do it? And of course, Woody said, yes. So this- so there's, I, I'm sorry, there's a little background noise. Cindy, can you check and see where that's coming from, please? I, I don't have the ability to mute that individual. Yeah. Go ahead, Nancy. Someone may need to mute, that's okay. So, so they wanted to just continue working this way. And as it happens, they never went back. They, they simply began working this way. It was so helpful for them that they continued it and they continued using it all day, every day, all the time. And it's nine years later now and this team is still working this way. And they've expanded to many more teams. Um, here's some more pictures. So here's the team. Uh, now they're using projectors here, but more recently they're using um, big screens and they're uh, this was a uh, what five years later <laughs> uh, at the company, and they've got a half a dozen or so teams. Now it's expanded even further, and you see that they're in small groups with large monitors, and they converse while they're going. I'll say a little bit more about how it actually works, but I just want to mention also that this is a technique that um, I introduced at Blue Fruit Software about six years ago. And the reason was they had some teams that were getting too large. And, but it was a good problem. Why? Because the company was growing. <laughs> but the teams were getting too large because they weren't able to spin up new team leads as fast as they would like. And so, you know, when we talked about this, I said to the owner, I think my programming might help with this uh, issue. And, you know, if, uh, if I could spend a little time with each team and explain it to them and help them get going, um, they might want to do it. So, you know, as time went forward, it did. It did address that problem nicely. Um, so let, let's see, I want to move on and tell you a little bit more about that before we get ahead of ourselves. So there's three simple rules in how this learning style works. Um, you have some roles. You have a driver, a navigator, and the rest of the team. Um, <clears throat> Okay, the driver, it says here the driver does not think. Well, that's a little extreme, but the driver does think. But the point is, it's not uh, four people sitting and watching while one person is head down, heads down pounding on the keyboard. That's not what it is. The driver is supposed to be a conduit so that the person navigating, sort of thinking at a little higher level, is verbalizing what the whole group is thinking. So the navigator is saying, okay, we need a method to you know, collect this data from these sources, and then we're going to compute it such and so way. And here's how we want to store it. You know, and they'll start working their way through that. They'll start creating the unit tests that build towards that feature. Um, so the navigator verbalizes what's going in on into the code. And 
the, and Llewellyn likes to say it this way, an idea must go through someone else's hands to get into the computer. Because the point here is to put the thinking out, out loud in the air so that everybody can be engaged and really thinking together and focusing. And we take turns, they rotate turns so that each person gets a chance to navigate and to drive. And people will have varying skill levels, but that's okay, the group kind of helps them out. And um, so that's just a quickie little description of how it works. There's lots more that can be said about that, but that's its own whole training course. Okay, so let's, let's continue a little further. Productivity. Um, people ask this question all the time. I asked when I first met Woody, I said, how is it going? How, you know, what, uh, what sort of a business result are you ending up with? Um, and he says, well, you know, people ask that all the time, five people at one computer, how can that be as productive as a whole team? Or I mean, five people working individually, how can that be, you know, uh, how, can, how can putting them all together be better or even as good as everybody working in parallel? Well, what the team did was they asked themselves this question too, <laughs> a few months uh, after they began working this way full time. But they already had features written on cards that they had implemented before they started using mob programming continuously. And they had a little set of cards from, uh, I think it was a two week period, but I could be wrong. They had a little set of cards from a period of time. And they said, well, let's check. Here's the cards we had, you know, for the couple of weeks back two months ago. Let's look at how many cards we finished in the most recent two weeks and think of a card as a software feature. So when they looked at it, it was definitely a bigger pile. So they knew they, it wasn't just a perception. They were definitely getting more done. Now people ask why. Um, it's important to understand that you know, programming is not stenography. It's not a contest for who can type the fastest or, or the most or generate the most lines of code. It's not that at all. Uh, you're making quite a number of design decisions as you code something up. There really isn't that clean separation between design it and build it, like I was taught back in school. I mean, that was a hoped for distinction, but it's not, it's not real. Um, and so there's that. There's also the fact that the team is balancing the needs of the stakeholders as they understand it against what they know about the technical constraints. Okay, so there's a lot going on, is all I'm trying to say. There's a lot more going on than just typing. <laughs> so when we ask about productivity, we have to think about that. Um, before I move on, there's one caution I'd like to mention. Um, managers often, you know, when they, when they are convinced that it is more productive, a lot of times they're tempted to mandate it. And I just want to say, if you're, you know, in a position where you uh, lead a software team or you manage them, uh, you should resist that impulse. Uh, I believe that a large part of why it worked out as well as it did for Blue Fruit, for Blue Fruit Software is that um, I said to the owner, you know, can we, can I introduce this to them in such a way that I say to them, it's entirely up to them whether or not they want to use this technique going forward. And can I say to them, it's okay with you either way, <laughs> whatever they choose. And, uh, and he was totally in favor because that's his philosophy too. He's a big believer in empowerment for the teams. So we did it on that basis. You know, I gave them a short training session and we tried it for an hour or so with each team. And, uh, you know, it was enough to give them some hands on. And we can say some more about that a little bit later. But let me move on. Let's talk about why it's better and why it's safer. Uh, how am I doing time-wise, Carolyn? So you have been speaking for about 12, 13 minutes. Beautiful, we're on track. Okay, so why is it better and safer? <clears throat> well, when you're coding solo, your best and your worst makes it into the code base. Um, now, in theory, the problems get caught early because you're testing, right? But I've been on lots of teams who weren't testing very thoroughly or very early or very often. So when you're coding solo, your best and your worst tends to get into the code and stay there maybe quite a long time. When you're pair programming, that's another one of those practices I mentioned, by the way. Not everybody uses it, but it's a good practice. Many Agile teams use it. It's just two people working together. When people pair program, the best of both of them makes it into the code. So the result is a bit better. In other words, you're avoiding more problems before they even start. Um, 
when you're using mob programming, it's the same dynamic, only now it's team-wide. So the, uh, the bar is even higher in a way, but without extra effort and without anybody having to become, you know, super powered in their level of knowledge and all that. So every person has strong and weak areas. We're not going to change that, but everybody can learn continuously and incrementally. And that's what is really superior about my programming. Um, the team at Hunter, uh, in, in a period of four years, they, uh, they had only two defects make it into production. I'd like to put that into context for you briefly. Um, the context of it is in a traditional software team that's not using the agile methods I'm talking about here, in a traditional team, it's common to have hundreds, even thousands of open defects um, being tracked. Why? Why would you let so many pile up? Well, a lot of times uh, it's just constraints. Um, maybe they weren't that critical. Maybe it took a while to find them. Maybe it doesn't seem worth the time to, to solve them all. This is something that the industry has accepted, in my opinion, way too long as inevitable. My own early Agile team working at a complex, difficult embedded systems project uh, that went three years. In the whole three year time, we generally had zero open defects. There were periods where we had one and maybe two. But we never had more than that. And, and this was a tricky project. Um, we are going to have gentle, a gentle reminder. You are at 15 minutes. Thank you. We are going to have a little takeaway sheet that's got some resources for those who want to follow up some more on these statistics here and some more about that kind of background because it's a whole talk by itself. But I just want to highlight there are two gigantic sources of waste that as an industry we're not doing enough about. And it's really the key to why the right agile and mob programming are so productive. These two sources of waste are time spent debugging software and time spent on handovers of work. Uh, when I start working with a team, I usually like to ask them, how much your time now is going to debugging software? A lot of times they'll tell me a half of their time. Some might say a third of their time. Um, I rarely get answers outside that range. That's a huge amount. I mean, you can just about double your productivity if you can eliminate that right there. Time spent on handovers. This chart is from uh, Jerry Weinberg um, in his software quality book. And he talks about the amount of lost um, time, uh, lost capacity that people have when they're spread over two or more projects. So just having somebody spread over two projects, you're losing 20% of that person's time. I don't know very many people on traditional teams who are only covering two projects. Most of them are covering three or more. And you're already losing just about half your time right there. Um, so this is really this is really something to be thought about uh, carefully. And but I'm going to move on because we're talking about mob programming now. But it helps you deal with this because a mob programming team is focused on one project and that's it, and they work on it until it's done. Contributors to safety. Having the team completely own their process means they're free to improve it the instant they see anything going wrong. Uh, less falls through the cracks because they're already cross-functional. But if anything does fall through the cracks, they check it right away and update their process. Their on-site customer is there to guide the product vision, so there's less room for misunderstandings. One of the people in the early photo there was the product owner. Um, so the daily retrospectives and daily pushes to production also help keep everything clean. And you couldn't you wouldn't dare push to production daily unless you had high confidence in your software. But that's why the whole test first approach or test driven development practice exists. That's also its own topic that we're not gonna cover here. Um, this uh, is the last slide in this section, but I just wanna mention one of the things that really triggered me when I heard uh, Woody Zool present about his team and, and the experience they had as they began using this practice Woody listed a whole set of things that he said melted away. There were problems that they never had to do battle with. They never had to go out and tackle these problems because they just melted. Communication problems. Why would you have that for teams together all the time? Decision-making problems. Well, if everybody is focused on the same information and they're all hearing it together, it's just a lot less 
uh, reason to have difficulty in making decisions. Uh, problems about scheduling, queuing, estimating, you just work on one problem at a time. So no need for those fights either, they disappeared. In my own early Agile team in the late 1990s, we were not using mob programming, but we were using um, some of the same principles that it amps up. <laughs> we were using a lot of strong communication among the team members and a lot of rapid feedback. What we saw melt away, see, this was what it was. It, it triggered me when he said, these problems melted away. And I said, yes, that's what happened with us too. Long debugging due to flaky hardware. It just started to disappear. Long debugging due to third party things that we couldn't control because we had a way of testing our software and our hardware independently from each other. We came up with that as part of our agile work. Individual ownership of code. Um, we didn't have to go and battle against it. It just didn't make sense anymore because of the way we were working as a team. So it, it drifted away. Um, we're gonna talk next about who's using it beyond software, but before I jump ahead, um, Carolyn, is there a question or clarification that you think I might address now? No, there's nothing, no outstanding questions. Let's turn the mic. This, Caitlin, you have the stage. Not, not quite yet, one slide, one slide and then she does. <laughs> I just wanna say something about my programming has you know, escaped into the wild. Woody's been speaking about it all over the planet and people are using it in Scotland, Sweden, Australia, South America, people are using it everywhere. And you know, they tweet about it and there's, there are hashtags you might wanna follow. And at this point, I'm going to stop sharing and let Caitlin pick up the story from where she's at. Okay, Caitlin, you ready? Yep, yep, I'm all ready. <laughs> all right, over to you, girl. Great, Let's, uh, I'm just gonna go to my screen real quick. If you all bear with me. Great, so show if, Carolyn, can you see it all right? So I see you in presentation. I see your slides on the left, which is fine. Great. And I see your presentation. Perfect. So, presentation yeah. Now, Great. Um, I think what Nancy's trying to tell you that she sees the row of slides on the left and she's wondering if that's the way you want to present. It's entirely up to you. Nope. I'm trying to get in presentation mode. Um, sorry, bear with me one sec. Um, Nancy, can you go back to yours? Sure, I can. Thanks. Um, so keeping it real. This is what Agile yeah. and mob programming so, is all about. Yeah, well, Nancy's loading it up. I can talk. Um, so I am not from a software background, as I mentioned, and I don't um, head up a software team. Um, I work at Blue Fruit Software. Um, we are similar to Nancy. We're in the sense of being in the embedded space, we should probably say not just embedded engineers use <laughs> mobile programming, um, but it was something we had in common. It's one of the reasons we brought Nancy in to do coaching is we knew she would understand our workplace. Um, embedded software isn't really a term many people talk about. Just quickly in terms of why quality matters to us, um, there's, as you guys all know, there's billions of computers around the world imagine kind of 10 times that amount, and that's the amount of computers in the things around the world that people interact with every day. And that's the software that we're working on. Um, the reason it's quality critical is oftentimes we're coping with things like the controls, connectivity, so whether or not a motor turns or um, the dosing of a system on a medical device, it could also be around that power management, um, it could also deal with security. So it's really important that we've got a strong grasp on secure, um, sorry, on quality for all of it. Um, this is what an embedded, <laughs> if you're still confused about what I'm saying with it, we're working on, we go really low. We're right down here. Um, we're not coding for computers, we're coding on the circuit boards. So cool. Um, so Blue Fruit Software, um, as Nancy mentioned, we've grown a lot. So I'm here mainly talking about the business impacts that we've had. Um, so we've not only grown since Nancy talked to us, we've actually doubled in size consecutively for two years in a row, and that can be extremely painful growth. Um, we've also increased across multiple teams. So that's not just more software engineers, that's more test engineers, even grown our HR team, we've grown our marketing and sales team, and we've uh, added in additional compliance people. Um, so that means we've got 
a lot of new people coming into the group that have to have different forms of communication and have different experiences. Um, we also have people across the company and we've been going for 20 years. So we have knowledge spread really far across the company from the different hundreds of projects we've worked on. Um, one of the things as well from that previous picture when I'm showing all the different bits that embedded software is in, we are, I should say, we're an outsourced embedded software team, which means we work with different product owners and different products and different teams on every single one of our projects. So on any given project, we might overlap with a hardware and electronics team, a compliance team, product team, software teams, occasionally marketing gets involved. Um, so again, there's lots of different paths of communication, but all of them are relying on the software that we create to make their product work. So that's where we get a huge amount of pressure on that quality and why we've got to make sure that what we put out works really well. Um, in terms of our culture, you know, Nancy mentioned we invited her to come in to talk. We do have a strong culture of learning and constant improvement and empowerment. Um, I think sometimes when we describe our culture to other people and we say how much we collaborate and work together, it makes it sound like some kind of nice kind of software nirvana place, but it actually makes a huge amount of sense business-wise. So alongside all of that growth, we've also seen improvements in turnover. We've seen improvements in um, our client relationships. We've seen clients go from working with us on a few projects to working with us for years. And that's because of the reliability that we're able to provide. And a lot of that is around the processes we use and especially one of them being mob programming. Shall I move on? Yes, please. <laughs> Going. Um, so Nancy talked a little bit about why tech teams mob. Our team, I mentioned quality is really, really critical. Um, I think Nancy covered that really well. Um, also improved client communication. So all of those different people we need to talk to. Um, oftentimes the solution for communication, when you hear that communication solves all problems, people tend to think that that means just more communication, more meetings, more emails, more phone calls. Um, what we try to think about is more effective communication. We, are we talking about the right things? Are we on the same page? It's really easy to misunderstand software requirements. It's really easy to misunderstand just conversations between team members. So that's so, so stay on this a minute because that was one question that came up in the chat, Caitlin. So just yeah. focus on these communication issues. One person has cross-functional teams working on a single project. Just keep that in the back of your head and yeah, keep going. Perfect. So, um, yeah, it's, it's helped, as I was saying, it's helped about the client communication. Um, I think one of the things as well is that um, it, in the space that we're working on in some of those products that I showed, you know, we do a lot of stuff at the moment in medical devices. Um, we're also working in AI and thinking about applying AI to remote devices, which has a whole heap of issues. Um, and so a lot of these spaces are really cutting edge. They're complex problems. Um, and they're cross-functional problems too, trying to do AI in a medical device and meet compliance regulations. You've got four different teams all trying to weigh in on what's the most important thing to pay attention to. So it's really important to think about how we can explore and try to solve those challenging problems and trying to get ideas from as many people around the room as possible. And that's where that shared knowledge comes in as well. What you don't want to do when you're solving a complex problem is having to have 10 different conversations with people in different rooms where they're not learning from each other and you're turning into some kind of translator. Um, it's nice to get everyone together so you can build up that shared knowledge and then you're able to spread it. Um, and we've seen, as Nancy said about, we get it from our clients too, about five people all working on one piece of code together that doesn't seem effective or efficient um, but if those five people get it done in half the time um, if they get it done in a quarter of the time and then it's better then it is more efficient and I've got some examples on how we've actually done that on the business side of things too not just when writing coding um, the last point that I think is really important to make is it's a great tool for bringing up new team members. Uh, again, Nancy mentioned we brought this in when we were thinking about splitting out and we needed new team leads, but we also have a challenge that 
most tech companies have around the world around recruitment. It's very hard to find talented software engineers. It's even harder to find embedded software engineers. It's not a very sexy language. Not very many people study C programming anymore. Um, so what we found is that we often need to bring in junior people who have potential and train them up. And that used to take us somewhere between a year or longer before they're actually able to contribute productively and valuably to a client project. Through mobbing and by having them learn from more experienced programmers on the team, they've been able to increase their knowledge and rapidly get on board. So we've been able to take that down from a year down to six months, sometimes down to six weeks, depending on how skilled they are. In terms of that cross learning as well, um, as we've been moving more and more into the medical space, we've also been bringing compliance experts into the mobbing and they've been upskilling the team on compliance knowledge. So that's another example of how it's not always just about one person, but sometimes it's about that shared knowledge. <laughs> um, this is what our mobbing looks like in action. We don't actually have those big open office spaces for our mobbing. We do for our, our teams. But what we decided to do was to set up um, dedicated rooms. Um, I just wanted to share this because I think it's worth saying that any meeting room can become a mobbing room. Um, all you need is a nice big shared screen. Um, when we get back to the office in this COVID environment, you can also limit the amount of people in the room. <laughs> so um, that's also quite good. Um, in this situation, you've got Jordan, she's hidden there behind the plant. She's the driver. The other three people, we've got two software engineers and a test engineer, they're contributing. Notice they're not actually typing in any of the code. Jordan's writing that all in. They're just watching and, and trying to edit as they go. Um, if you look at the next slide, Nancy, this is an example of where we are mobbing on some hardware as well. So it's great because in this instance, we've got coders, we've got the product people, we've got the hardware there. What might not be obvious right away is we've also got four people dialing in remotely and they're all contributing to the same conversation. Now, in this instance, we all do have our own computers, but they're all working on the same document at the same time. So one person's driving on that document and they're all viewing it. And we started working in this way a little while ago when a few of our engineers wanted to work remotely. Um, and it's been really fortunate because if you look at the next slide, um, it's helped us transition for working from home on COVID. So we've been doing more mobbing, I'd say, recently. Um, this is actually an example of our business side of the team. Um, and so it's not, like I said, just engineers. Um, this one, we're actually, I don't mind if people say it, this is we're working on our own internal R&D project at the moment on an AI audio categorizer. Um, and we're using a tool here that's called Miro Boards. They've got tons of different templates. They're really nice to work on together. Um, and they've got a free version. Uh, we use the enterprise version because I make about 10 of these a day. Um, but it, it's, it's pretty nice to use. The big thing here, so I'm driving and everyone can see what I'm writing and what I'm adding and they can edit it and make sure that I'm capturing the right things. So if we, yeah, so as we kind of promised in this talk, this is about how we're working beyond um, the development team. So as Nancy said, this isn't a top-down command. Um, what we saw was that we, we saw effectiveness basically on the development team. They were getting stuff out and they were shipping it very quickly. And we wanted to try to see if there's something we could do on our team. Um, again, we work a lot of our work on sales, marketing, business development, and HR requires input from the development team. Um, traditional way of doing it is we would work on something, then we'd maybe pass it to the development team, ask them for advice, we'd input their suggestions. We'd then write some more, they would edit it, this back and forth and back and forth. By mobbing, we can bring everyone together. Um, and so it's really something that we've seen as a proactive way to get stuff done. Um, it's also helped with coaching. So it's helped my team to increase our technical skills by bringing those technical people in. 
Um, and as you know, you mentioned earlier, it can really break down some of those internal silos as well. It helps getting these different teams with different backgrounds. Sometimes they have preconceived notions of each other, but if they're working together productively to solve a problem, it, it generates a bit of respect across the different teams. They can see each other at their best. Um, this is actually an example of our HR team. Well, us, so we've got marketing, HR, and the developers all together. And what we're mobbing on here is writing a job description for our software engineers. I mentioned it's hard to find them. It's really important we have a job de description that attracts them. Um, gentle, right. gentle, gentle reminder. We have 15 yep. minutes left in our session Great. today. Great. So um, if you go to the next slide, I'll keep talking about this picture, but, um, and I think if you see that photo, it's really easy to just assume this is brainstorming, right? It's just a fancy word for brainstorming, but it's not. And the big difference is in a brainstorming session, we might all be sitting down and writing up notes and thoughts on what a good job advert is. In this session, what we did is we all sat down and we wrote the job advert together. And we, at the end of the session, when we left that meeting, we had a ready to post on the website job advert. The marketing team knew exactly how to promote it and what um, tone to take. Um, the developers were all happy and didn't complain about it later. Um, NHR had a job advert written and signed off by all the departments in a few hours instead of something that would sometimes take weeks. So that's the real big difference between brainstorming and mobbing is brainstorming is great and it's all about idea generating, but mobbing is about output generating. You wanna create something in a mobbing session. Um, critical to being able to do that, especially if you're trying to think about um, a particular outcome, is pay attention to who you've invited to the mob and make sure you've got all the people you need there to help you solve the problem. Um, also, make sure you've got a problem to solve. <laughs> it helps, it's really important to be focused in your session. So here's a business um, example of how we've done it. Um, this was something we did around a client complaint. Um, we had an issue where, as happens regularly on software projects, um, scope creep, uh, they said they, they hoped something, uh, they gave us a list of requirements and they hoped it would take a certain amount of time but as naturally happens, um, they wanted more things, more features, more addition um, onto the project. And so it was starting to get longer and a bigger budget than they expected. What normally happens in this situation and what happened here is usually the head of product or one of the senior executives will get in touch with me and will say, what are you spending all my money on? And why is it going up? And why is the budget increasing? I then have to go away and talk to the development team, find out what's going on, and we have this, this series of meetings and investigations and over a few weeks we'll come to a solution and maybe some suggestions. Um, and that whole time everyone is stressed and it's painful. Um, what we did instead was we listened to the problems and then we set up a meeting and we worked through the problem together. We listened to the customer and what they were having issues with. We talked about the problem of us coping with a lot of new requirements and we came up with a plan. We came up with a simple solution of how we would prioritize our actions. Um, the owner of the company felt like he was back in control of his project and his budget. I felt like my team knew what they were doing and I was confident everyone was happy. And the best outcome was that myself and the owner of the company didn't talk again until the product was released and they were thrilled. Um, so as Nancy said and Woody said, it was a great way for erasing a lot of these problems. This was only part way through the project as well. So it's not like this was at the end, this was at the beginning. So it saved a number of additional meetings going forward. Um, my last example, and I'll keep it quick, um, we've been recently doing it on estimating as well. So um, again, when we do estimates, we've got to consider, uh, especially on medical devices, we need to consider software, we might need to consider the user experience, we might need to consider compliance, well, we definitely need to consider compliance. Um, so when we're doing all of that, it doesn't make sense to have to go out to each one of those individual people and have them contribute to an estimate separately. Um, so what we've started doing, and we've only really recently started doing this, is actually mobbing on writing the proposal together. 
So we'll have everyone sit in the room. We've all got the brief notes ahead of time and I'll drive and I'll start writing up the proposal and people contribute their bits as we go. And what's happened with that is not only do we get it written faster, but we're learning from each other. We're working together better. We're discussing how we'd approach the project. So in some ways, we're not just writing the proposal, but we're getting ready to work with that client. We're thinking proactively and we're all on the same page. And what that's meant for me as the head of that team is I've seen the amount of time it takes sometimes two to three weeks to put together a proposal with back and forth go down to two hours. Um, and that is a massive difference in terms of how many proposals we can get out, the speed we can get them out, and the speed we can hopefully get that client on board with us on. The quality is much better too, because we've had all of those people checking their different parts and making sure that we're all on the same page. So I'll just leave it. My last thing, sorry, Nancy, I'm ready, <laughs> is that we've adapted this. So Blue Fruits adapted what Mobby means to Blue Fruit and our developers do it in a particular way. My teams adapted it. We don't call each other drivers and we don't use some of the terminology that some of our software teams would say is critical for mob programming, but it's fine. What we've done is we've taken the principles, we've taken the learning, we've taken a lot of the stuff Nancy's talked about, the benefits, and we've made it work for us. We've made it be something that we can use. And that's something I'd suggest as well is play around with it. Don't try to rewrite your culture around mobbing, but think about how it could fit into the way that your team works. Thank you, that was, that was wonderful. So we're gonna open it up with about 10 minutes remaining. We do wanna make sure that there are some time for questions. Nancy, do you have one or two things to mention? Just Super wanted to quick. offer a few ways for people to get started. There are some books that we could recommend. Um, okay, so let, go ahead. Does it here, you can, there's a hashtag you can follow to find out lots more. Um, I'll just move on quickly here. Here are some books we recommend. Um, the two at the left are specific about mob programming and the two at the right, one is uh, mine and Brian's and the other is uh, by Amy Edmondson. It's an excellent book. And why don't we take questions now? Oh, I don't wanna to forget to mention this is on tomorrow and it's uh, no cost. So yeah, this, I'll put the link into the chat now. I think it does right now. I don't see any questions in the chat yet. But let me say that empowerment, can, can one of you say something about how this empowers members? Yes, Caitlin, who would normally have quieter voices. Yeah, I think it's, this is really interesting. So we talked about this a little bit when we were prepping for this and knowing the event that we were going to and being aware that some of the challenges, speaking about women in tech as well as sometimes you can suffer from imposter syndrome that might not just because you're be because you're a woman some people on my team suffer it because we're not technical so when we're sat on technical meetings and we don't come from a technical background sometimes it can be hard to speak up but what's nice about mobbing is everyone is encouraged to contribute ideas and conversations and so it's a really nice time for people whether they're junior or they come from different backgrounds or they have different experience to be able to contribute to that problem solving and what we found is actually when we do more mobbing, it builds people's confidence because they start to see how they can contribute to the conversation. So it is a nice way to encourage that. Um, one thing I would suggest is that if you're going to try doing it and you yourself or you have team members that are, are a bit shy, make sure that you give them the encouragement to know they can participate. Um, sometimes ways that we'll work around it is if people don't like speaking or are a bit nervous, they might be able to contribute via comments like we've done in the chat today. Yeah, I'd like to add something too, if I could, on that topic. And here's our contact information. I find someone asked me, uh, um, you know, what's, what's best about my programming to me. I think it really helps women to be um, perceived better when they're part of a team. Um, you can't work closely with a whole team of people without them seeing, you know, where the good ideas are coming from and, you know, who's contributing. Not that it's competitive because it's not. It's very supportive in a team that works well. And it's almost like you can't do this. You can't behave this way and not develop some respect and understanding for each other. 
So I think it's really great for women to help women develop the confidence and the, um, I don't know, just everything else that you need in order to progress a little further and, and grow your own skills, capabilities. Uh, I think one of the things I really like about my programming is it fights against the tendency that we have to say, oh, well, there's the technical engineering practices and over here are the people practices. You know, it helps, it helps you to not separate them. Yeah, I think you make a good point, Nancy. One of the th reasons why our junior people like it as well is it takes away the blame culture a bit. So when you're contributing and making something as a team, the team produced that. So it's not one person's problem. It's not one person's fault. And because you've taken away that blame culture, it means people are a little bit bolder to put out ideas. They're more willing to also put out critique um, and to make sure that what the team produces is good. Um, and usually that, that is also why you get a higher quality of thing. It's because everybody's working together to make a good thing. Um, but it also means if something doesn't go to plan, you've got a whole bunch of people to lean on <laughs> with each other. So, you know, you can learn together on it, but it does, it takes away a little bit of that fear for junior people. Yeah, I find that with solo programming, you know, it's so easy for say two different people or two subgroups to go down different paths and then they discover it's not coming together. It's not going to integrate. And then they feel dug in. They feel like they have to battle it out because one or the other is going to have to back up, <laughs> you know, and it's so easy to just not do that. Well, I won't say it's easy. I mean, it takes some effort to understand and master the, the different way of working. But once you do, it's, I don't know, it just makes so much sense. Mm. So are there other questions that we can answer? So I don't see any other questions in the chat. So let me just give people a minute. I know we're about to be pulled into our next sessions, wherever they are. Um, so I think I do want to just restate, we're going to make sure that Witty has this deck. We're going to make sure that Witty has the takeaway resources, some of which I've listed, been listing in the chat. and. Certainly, if anyone has questions or this has sparked interest, Caitlin and Nancy and I would love to follow up with you. And the best way to reach each of us is probably LinkedIn or the contact information you see in front of you. It has been a pleasure being part of this witty panel. Thank you very much. Have a great conference. Thank you. Yeah, and I just to say with what Carolyn said as well, um, if anybody wants to ask any questions, whether it's about mob programming or any of the embedded questions, I probably can't tell you how your electric bike works, but I'd be happy to connect you with a bunch of people who can. Um, and yeah, feel free to send questions my way. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a great session. Thank you, Cindy. Bye. Bye. Thanks.